This is 91.3 FM WCW in Worcester, Massachusetts, the Dr. Chris Radio of Horror program. And tonight on Radio of Horror, we have Todd Cameron on the show with us, the operator of Outpost31.com, a website dedicated to John Carpenter's 1982 science fiction horror alien movie, The Thing. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Todd. Thanks for having me on, Dr. Chris. You know, one thing was just came to mind before we were doing um, take number one of the thing is, you know, the thing, the creature, and I don't think it's so much. I don't think it's ever named in the original either. The uh, the thing from another world is that's the original movie, right? Yes, the 1951 film. Yeah, Correct. they they just basically call it the thing. The the species of the thing is never is never mentioned in any like other media or comic books or the prequel movie that came out like four or five years ago right yeah i I don't think they really know what species it is it's it's kind of a mystery um the the alien in the 1982 john carpenter film is is quite different from the 51 film it's 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 much more like the original source material from the 1938 novella who goes there correct you know what'd be funny is dc comics has been doing a ton of crossover stuff whatever they want to do crossovers with anybody anybody it's like you got crossovers with batman and teenage mutant ninja turtles and you have planet of the apes and green lantern i think it would be fantastic if like green lantern met like the thing species <laughs> there's a lot of that's come up you know the thing versus aliens the thing versus the blob is a popular one we had a uh, the thing versus batman fan fiction yeah there's been some pretty pretty funky crossovers with the thing and i have two pieces of original artwork hanging up on my wall right now one of which is a cover is a one of those sketch covers that you can get from like marvel dc that they do of uh, john carpenter's the thing versus benjamin j Grimm, the thing from the fantastic four and then another piece of like a poster art that I had an artist do. He's like, you know, come up with anything. I'll draw it. And I was like, okay, I would love to see Benjamin J. Grimm versus John Carpenter's The Thing. And it's this like massive, just blob tentacle thing wrapping itself around like Ben's arms. And he's saying, it's clobbering time. <laughs> what was your first experience with the movie? When did you first see it? Oh, my God. I probably didn't see it until I was, I think, an adult. You know, um, I was aware of the movie, but I didn't know anything about it other than just that really iconic image of the, uh, you know, the guy in the uh, the winter parka with the light coming out of his face. Um, right. But yeah, I kn- iconic, iconic artwork by Drew Struzan there. That's a classic, classic movie poster. But other than just seeing that, I had no idea what the movie was about. I never really did any type of research into it. I never, you know, science fiction, horror was never my big thing. Um, growing up, I was heavily into vampires, and that was my segue into horror in general, um, and then slasher movies too. But eventually I got around to, I th- think, seeing it on TV or watching it on VHS. I, no, that was right. That was what it was. I bought it on a VHS tape. Um, it was brand new. I was thinking it was like a Walmart or Target or whatever. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I should watch this movie that I've been, um, you know, people are like, you've never seen The Thing. And I, I I think I watched it on VHS in like 98, 99, maybe. Wow. That's when it first came out on DVD in 1998. Oh, was that the original Universal release? Yeah, well, the first orig- the first DVD release ever was uh, September of 98. Oh, wow. Yeah. And now we have that amazing uh, Screen Factory release. Right, yeah. Last year, last fall in 2016, we had the uh, the Scream Factory Blu-ray. Um, we've had uh, a few different DVD releases of the movie, and uh, later this year, we have the new uh, 4K restoration by Arrow Video in the UK coming out. And just before we get into your site, what is your opinion, in just a few words, on the uh, 2011 remake slash prequel? Um, it's definitely a prequel, and you know what? It was entertaining. I was definitely entertained by it. Um, I really, my focus and love is the 82 film. Um, I think they did a a decent job with the 2011 film. Um, It doesn't really take away or add to Carpenter's film. So, you know, it's kind of a standalone prequel. And and they did, I got to say, they did a very good job with it. I would love to see if they can ever do anything with the footage that was shot with the practical effects you know we've all seen those uh, clips and everything right yeah it makes me wonder i've seen the clips as well and read the whole backstory on on that um, on what happened and 
uh, it's an entirely different film basically now. Yeah. So it, it would be fantastic to see it with the practical effects right through to the end. And I think one day with, um, you know, with uh, the way technology keeps improving with like restoring films and stuff like that, maybe those, um, those, you know, all the, all the stuff that was shot can be cleaned in a way and altered in a way to make, you know, put it back into the film, take out the CGI I mean, God, look at Nightbreed. We got Nightbreed years later. Never, no one ever thought Nightbreed was ever going to get the release that it got, and it finally did. Um, so there's hope out there. How did you get Outpost31.com started? Wow. Well, I originally got on and started looking up the thing online, I guess, around 98 when the DVD came out. Uh-huh. Um, and I found the original fan site for the film, which no longer exists. Um, it was a fan site for The Thing and, and Day of the Dead. Um, I don't even know the, the fellow's name who, who ran the sites, but he was a fan of those two movies. And it was a very, very good fan site for The Thing. It was pretty comprehensive, especially for the time. Um, I believe he created it originally in 97, um, 20 years ago now. And he no longer updated it. So by 99, he'd abandoned it. Oh. Um, around 2000, I decided that there's so much happening with The Thing that we needed to make a brand new website for this movie. The, uh, how, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, maintain a, um, like as a detailed site like yours, but it, does it take a lot of work to keep it up to date and everything? Um, well, hey, that's a good question. Um, as you know, this site's actually only about three weeks old today. Um, that's why oh, I wow. Put it on. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, this is a brand new website. It went up three weeks ago today, which was the 35th anniversary of the thing, June oh. 25th. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the existing site from October of 2001, when we first went online, uh, the site got bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, with fan fictions and fan essays and fan images and just a plethora of material on the film that it became unmanageable. Um, You know, people were overwhelmed with the site. Um, It was an old platform. It was very difficult to update. Um, So around Christmas this year, uh, about six months ago or so, I decided that we needed to make a new website and took the plunge rebuilding it uh, in May, uh, early May, to have it ready for uh, late June, about three weeks ago. So it's a brand new website. Now, there was one thing on here that I thought was really cool, um, and pff, again, I'm not going to profess to being a super expert about the thing. I mean, my expertise is, again, more in like the slasher films or like uh, horror comics. I'm, I'm big into horror comics. Return of the Thing, a Frank uh, Darabont TV series? Oh, right. Yeah, I believe wow. I put the script for that on the new website. I believe it's there. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. I'm like, I've never heard of this before. Yeah. I, I haven't even read it, to be completely honest with you. Um, but uh, Frank Darabont was going to take this on as a TV miniseries. And I believe it, it definitely obviously fell through. And around that time, also, a little bit of trivia here, George Clooney was going to try and make Who Goes There um, as a TV miniseries as well. So there was some action on the, you know, on, on the film and the original source material, Who Goes There. But this is really cool that you have the uh, unproduced uh, TV series scripts for this so people can read what would have been the return of the thing. So was this going to be another creature that comes down or the or the thing from the movie Live? Uh, like I said, I haven't even read it, um, so I don't, I don't even know. Um, I don't know if it would have been good or bad or what. Um, you know, trying to do anything with the thing in that universe is, is very tricky because – the original novella is excellent. Have you read it? Who goes there? No, I haven't. Um, you know, every time I think about the thing, I do I'll go, "Oh, I should look up that story and read about it." But then I just I, I don't follow through on it. <laughs> we do have it on our website. We have it goes there as a PDF and a Word file, so so fans can read it. Um, I'm not sure. So you know, like I was saying originally, "Who Goes There" is a fantastic short story novella, and then of course Carpenter's film is is an outright masterpiece. So trying to play with that universe is, is extremely difficult, as they did in 2011. And, and like I said, I think they did a, a decent job for what they were trying to do. Um, but who knows what this would have been like. Uh, script for the unmade sci-fi channel, Frank Darabont TV miniseries sequel. So, yeah, I, I think trying to make a sequel to the film would be even more challenging than trying to do you know, a spinoff or, or a prequel. 
Now, the one thing I noticed isn't on your site, and maybe it is, and I'm just not seeing it. Uh, do you have anything about the video game that came out on PlayStation That's 2? That's you ask that, because one of the real motivators that got us going with Outpost 31 was the video game, because the video game was due out in the summer of 2002 on the uh, 20th anniversary. Uh-huh, yep. And now the game, I, I never played it. I'm not a gamer. Um, but now the game is, what, uh, you know, 10, 10 years old? Uh-huh. Uh, or more, 15 years, what am I saying? 15 years old, I don't even know if people play it anymore. Um, but that's a good good point, is that no, on the new site, there's uh, we don't have anything for the video game. But on the old site, there was a fan who ran that section, and there was an extensive um, section for the video game. Another thing that's really cool that I didn't even know about is coming out, but I, we haven't even had San Diego Comic-Con yet, so this is probably why I haven't heard about it. There's a Thing art book coming out, which looks fantastic. Right. you yeah, got all the goods on your copy. site. <laughs> I should have a copy of that in my hands tomorrow. Oh, um, look at you. Brought to the guys by Printed in Blood. Um, they're doing some fantastic work. I've been talking with them a lot the past few weeks about stuff. They are going to be at uh, Comic-Con this coming weekend mm -hmm. um, with the art book. And uh, we have a lot of cool stuff coming out this year, actually. We have the, the, the Thing art book by Printed in Blood. And we have a... Um, a board game by Mondo Tees. Um, Infection at Outpost 31 is coming out uh, this Halloween. And it looks like on the way we have a another board game which looks incredibly awesome um, on who goes there. So it's a role-playing board game of the novella. It, I mean, it just... It, the, um, the Mondo board game looks really, really cool. I'm kind of hoping... That Mondo, who also puts out vinyl records, I own a lot of their stuff. I have um, definitely contributed to um, all of their children's college funds very handsomely <laughs> over the last few years. Uh, I just purchased Castlevania III, uh, Dracula's Curse, actually, from their website. Um, do, do, they have a, do, do they have a vinyl of the Thing music coming out, do you know? Yes, actually... Um... Here's where I'm, I'm going to be a little rusty with stuff, but yes, uh, a, a, a reprint vinyl of the Thing soundtrack uh, was put out just this year, and right now the name of the company that put it out is escaping me, but um, yeah, there was a repressing done just this year of, of the soundtrack on vinyl. Um, I can't think of the name to save my life right now of, of who did it, but they're 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 fairly large. They do film soundtrack re repressing and re-releases. Now you got to you you definitely have to say that um uh Jack Burton is probably the oh I'm sorry <laughs> I'm thinking of Kurt Russell's character from Big Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble, yeah. <laughs> So I bet Kurt Russell's character in the thing, Jack Burton, was not in the thing. Jack Burton is the fictional character from Big Trouble in Little China, another John Carpenter movie. <laughs> uh, Kurt Russell's uh, hero in the thing is one of cinema's greatest, um, you know, kind of like, un, you know, like not, he doesn't, he's not like set up to become a hero, but he has to be in the end. Yeah, he's he's the quintessential anti-hero, R.J. McCready. Um I'm currently working on a project just about this character. I, I can't reveal too, too much at all uh, tonight on the show, but uh, it's quite a massive project, and I've been working on it for more than half a year already um, that's coming down the road. So a little bit more about R.J. McCree. Coming up soon, and soon I mean in half a decade, uh, <laughs> on June 25th, 2022... For the 40th anniversary of the thing, you have quite the expedition, um, uh, like a tour, going out to the original Outpost uh, 31 site. That's right. I originally went up to the filming location in Stewart, BC in the summer of 2003. And when I went up there, it was such an awesome experience. Not only the thing, uh, filming location and remains of the, the set that we found, but just the location itself was stunning to see um so we vowed that we would one day go back um the years have gone by and how we've decided that you know the 40th anniversary will be a you know a fantastic uh, marker and, and time to go back um and we're planning a group trip uh, we had a lot of fans interested over the years so um yeah planning to go back for the 40th anniversary in the summer of 2022 
Now, what do people have to do in order to get involved in this? And how much of it um, do they have to do themselves? You know, what are the tickets? You know, the nitty gritty well, people really want to know about. Obviously, they have five years to save up for a trip like this. Yeah, right. That's and myself included. That's the one thing I've been saying to people. You know, it, it's not going to be a cheap trip. Um, but the reason why we announced it so soon is that almost anybody on any budget with five years, if you really want to do this, I mean, you're going to be able to, to put the money aside to do it. So we're giving fans the heads up like crazy. Um, there's no tickets. I mean, the location's a, a public lo- location on, on Crown Land. Uh-huh. I mean, anybody can go there anytime. Um, but we're doing it as a group trip because, you know, the more the merrier. And uh, it is a little tricky to find uh, initially going up there so i guess one of one of the the perks to doing it as a group trip is that we know exactly where we're going um you know so we'd meet ahead of time like the day before or something in in vancouver or or, or terrace uh british columbia and then head on up to stewart Hyder, um which are border towns between alaska and uh, and bc now is there any structure yeah, is there any type of structure up there or is it just like flat grassy land uh, flat, flat, rocky land, land with a massive glacier just to this one side uh, of the road that heads up. The, the site itself is located about a 45-minute drive north of the towns of Stuart Hyder. Yeah, about 45 minutes north of those two towns, up this crazy, crazy kind of road carved into the side of the mountain, uh, literally, which is the original road to get up to the mine um, up there, which is the only way that they, they could access this site is because the Grand Duke mine was, was operating back then, um, and the road was plowed twice a day, so the cast and crew could get up to this crazy remote location. Um, but there is no existing set, uh, unless you know what you're looking for. Um, they blew the, uh, the camp up at the end of the movie and, and burned it. Um, but we knew exactly where to look and found the exact location. Um, and remains of the Outpost 31 set are literally strewn everywhere. Um, so you can find small burned pieces, remains of the re- wreckage of the of the camp, um, and kind of the piece de resistance was the finding the the wreckage of the Norwegian helicopter. Um, I guess about you know a couple hundred meters from the camp. Um, we were not expecting that at all in 2003, and and when we stumbled across it, we knew immediately what it was. Oh wow! Um, we were like, uh, yeah, we're like, wow, that that's the Norwegian chopper, you know, just sitting there. Um, and, and my buddy and I, Steve, um, actually cut the, uh, the rotor blade off, off the, the wreckage and brought it home with us, a 15 foot section of the rotor blade. What of that do you think is still there today? Um, there's plenty of the camp left. I mean, it's been, it's been 14 years since I've been up there and I guess it'll be another five before we, we go back. I'm sure a lot of the, the camp will still be there. Because there was there was a lot of it strewn about, like plenty of you know chunks and pieces of, of burned wood, um, clearly painted gray. They were all gray painted still. So I mean that that's the camp, um, and the wreckage of the chopper, of course, will, will still be there. The type of tours to go to places like this. I was trying to uh, think of a, a movie one, but like a movie one couldn't come to mind. But a historical one would be like Dracula's Castle, and they do like a tour for that like every year. Um, this definitely writes right up there for like science fiction fans because I can't think of a lot of like sci-fi style tours like like this anywhere else. You know, I know the Evil Dead fans yeah. like would love to have you know the original Evil Dead cabin had still existed, but it doesn't, and the, the entire land is you know pro- private property within a state that allows you to shoot trespassers dead. <laughs> so <laughs> the, 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 the Evil Dead people like Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell have made very clear to fans: do not go out there. You will go to a state that the owner is allowed to kill you if you trespass. This is a pretty big deal for for science fiction fans. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting that it is on Crown land that's public. So, I mean, in the summertime, there's hikers walking by probably daily um, right by the site, and they have no idea what it is. Um, yeah, totally. And maybe um, some of them are Thing fans, and they're not realizing that they're walking through, you know, film possibly. history. Yeah. But you know what the, what what's kind of preserving it and protecting it in a sense, though, Chris, is that the is the remote location. It's it's not in Tennessee or, or Pennsylvania. It's in uh, uh, you know literally Alaska. Um, so it's 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 a trek to get to. It's not like you can you can. I mean, the closest largest city is Vancouver, and I think it's twenty one hour drive. Um, you know from the site. So 
and that itself is, is far north just from anybody traveling from the U.S. So um, it's not like it's it's easy access. What are what are some other great features about your site you want fans to uh, check out? One thing I did notice uh, we talked off the air about is uh, the book section. You list the comic books. Uh, I wasn't sure if you're aware, but there's like a thing uh, novelization of the movie. I think it's written by. Um, oh shoot! Now the name completely escapes me. And he's written like hundreds of these uh, novelizations of movies. Um, yeah, I think you're thinking of Alan Dean Foster. Yes, the novelization. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's it's a phenomenal read if you haven't read it. Um, it's it's based on the script, of course, and um, it has a couple sequences that are fantastic that had actually had to get cut from the, from the final film. Um, and they're, you know, myself and almost every single fan that I've spoken to agrees that, you know, they were incredibly creepy, creepy scenes um, that unfortunately budget and time uh, Carpenter and company had to cut them out of the film. But if you read the novel, um, you'll get these scenes, you know, the best next best thing to seeing them in film. Um, and they're fantastic. So I highly, highly recommend the book. And it is on our website in the books section. And then there was another comic book on here I didn't even know anything about. Like, I knew about the original, uh, is it four? Or no, okay, so there are two separate four-issue miniseries by Dark Horse comic books. Um, mm-hmm. But I didn't know about the more recent Dark Horse comic book written by Steve Niles, The Thing, The Norwegian Nightmare. Was that tied into the 2011 film? Yeah, basically. Um the Norwegian Nightmare. Yeah, what, it's definitely a 2011 release, and it was definitely tied into the prequel. Um, but it was the Northman. Yeah, here it is, the Northman Nightmare. Um, Dark Horse Comics, but it's an online comic. It wasn't a uh, hard copy. Okay. I will definitely have to email my contacts at Dark Horse Comics to find out if they have any... I mean, I haven't seen anything in previews lately, and I haven't seen any announcement this year, so I don't think it's coming out this year. But I would love... To, I, I'm definitely going to email them to ask them if they have any intentions of releasing the Thing comic books in trade paperback and coinciding with the 40th anniversary in, like, five years. Wow. Um, if, that would be really cool. Yeah, so maybe I'll send him an, I'll send them an email to find out if they have any, you know, if they have any inkling to do it or if they even own the rights to the comic to be able to do that anymore. I mean, right. sometimes the rights and stuff like that, even though you publish the comic book, doesn't mean you still own the rights to do anything with it. Dark Horse published yeah. Star Wars comic books for 20 years, and they don't have the rights to publish those comic books in the trade paperbacks anymore. Uh, Marvel now publishes them under the Star Wars Legends banner. So, um, you know, it just might be a matter of, like, just rights and stuff. Who knows? Um, uh, yeah, I tell you, the, the thing is not over yet. That's all I'll say. It's a fantastic film, but it's also a fantastic story. Um, you know, from from John W. Campbell, um, you know, originally written in 1938. So um, there's more to come from the thing for sure. And I am a fan of the Dark Horse comics, especially specifically the uh, the, the two part uh, sequel series. Yeah, um, I and, think I think they're a fun read. And we could also in like five years, because who knows what's going to happen in video game technology in five years. Um, we could maybe see the thing video game re released like in HD, you know, with like, you know, stuff cleaned up. You know, there was like the, the the video game was, I think, a fairly big success, but it had its uh, quirks and problems here and there. Um, right. Yeah, I think that was Black Lake, Black Label Games, and they were working really closely with us on that release of the game, which was kind of cool back in in two thousand late two thousand one when we first got Outpost Thirty One up. Um, but another video game, I wouldn't doubt it at all down the road that something like that would come um and you know we're, we're, there's definitely some fun stuff planned that's for sure again the website is outpost31.com you can go there and find out all sorts of great information about the thing including uh storyboards and a bunch of other stuff that we didn't uh we didn't cover but i didn't want to go over every single little minuscule detail about the website so that way you can discover it for yourself and you can also join the group on facebook uh which the the, the uh hmm, sorry i have the link up right here and it closed on me uh you can join the outpost 31 discussion group on facebook and probably get up to dates about the upcoming tour from todd that he'll post on there i assume yeah for sure yeah we were on instagram twitter and we also have a facebook page and our facebook group is is it's only half a year old and it's become very very active with some really cool people on there cool um i did notice somebody posted something about the void did you see the void uh, no, it's on my watch list, though. It's on Netflix right now here in the U.S., so uh, I definitely want to give it a look. 
correct. I was um I was in kind of a um, not great mood yesterday. I was so excited. I was all ready to watch The Void, and then I got this text from somebody. I and I was just like, I don't want to watch that movie now. <laughs> I'm gonna watch Silicon Valley because that's that's happy. <laughs> I know the void's gonna be like horrific and body hard, depressing. People are gonna die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I, the void has definitely become like I've heard like it's one of those movies that you definitely watch uh, when you're uh, when you're prepared for it. <laughs> true enough. It's funny you say that too because horror is definitely not my most favorite genre right now. I've definitely drifted far, far out of horror. Um, so I don't watch a lot of horror movies at all, especially recently. Um, but I, I've heard decent things about The Void, and I'll probably give it a give it a watch soon. I can't be that way doing this show for the last ten years since uh, two thousand and seven, and now I have like two podcasts that I do: Supernatural Creatures and Lore and the Dead TV podcast. So um, that would uh, that'd be very difficult to do. However, now that I know about this, uh, this unmade thing script, I'm definitely going to bring it up on the dead TV podcast. And we'll give you a plug on that, uh, coming up, um, in uh, the next time we do the recording for it to just talk about like, Oh, Hey, did you hear about this canceled project about the thing TV series? How awesome would that have been? Go to the website and read the scripts. <laughs> cool, man. Again, Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, maybe we'll do an update in like four years when we get a little closer to the yeah. uh, <laughs> expedition. Yeah, there's some pretty fun stuff planned, man. So, yeah, we'll definitely talk to you again for sure about the thing. It's it's not over yet, that's for sure. Absolutely. Did you ever hear the joke, by the way, about the 2011 thing and Alien vs. Predator? No. Okay, so did you ever see Alien vs. Predator? Yeah. All right. So at the end of the movie, the um, the the lone survivor, that girl, after the predators leave, she's just like left out there in the in the in the in the in the cold. And we, the joke was made, I think, it was like on DreadCentral.com, that she continued walking into the cold. And eventually, she'd run into Mary uh, Mary, what's her name from the from from the thing prequel. Right. They're both two <laughs> females left in Antarctica at the end of the movie. Right. Basically, <laughs> yeah, because Mary's also kind of wandering out into the Antarctica by herself. <laughs> True it's like, yeah. how do you end the movie with your hero just wandering into the absolute cold, deathy, icy, freezing tundra, which she would never survive from? <laughs> I guess just a short time later, we've got, uh, you know, Childs and, and McCready sitting out there as well. Yeah, basically. <laughs> All right, Todd, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on, Chris.